I hate to say it, but if you are having fun in the bedroom, there will never be a way to 100% guarantee that an egg cell will not meet the sperm. But what I hope this video shows you is that there are a huge range of ways to significantly reduce this from happening and getting pregnant when you don't want to. So sit back and enjoy listening to me explain everything you need to know about contraception. Like this video if you do enjoy it and we'll dive straight into the video. And if you guys wanted to join the Nana Squad, my sister and I's online clothing brand, I will leave a link there down below so you guys can check it out. I really wish I had my glasses still sometimes when I film these videos because I am going to be in my element sharing biology with you guys and talking about everything contraception, any intervention that reduces your risk of pregnancy basically, something that I can assume a lot of us do not want right now, hence why you are watching this video and I hope it really helps you guys out, I hope you learn something in this video and at the end of the day I need to stress that your choice of contraception is your choice. I'm not making that decision for you, but I hope this gives you the information you need or the resources to go away and do your own research and decide on which form of contraception you want to use. And so yeah, definitely like it if you do enjoy it. Comment down below and subscribe if you are new. So the first part of this video is going to be about the different types of contraception and their effectiveness. So how effective are they in preventing pregnancy? Because it's only really condoms that also like reduce your risk of STIs or sexually transmitted diseases. None of the others really do that. Now the first thing I'm going to say is that all of these are largely for use by females, like there are no FDA approved male forms of contraception except condoms really. There are some being developed but that's a whole other story in itself and debate we're not gonna get into that. So I'm gonna split it into like four different categories. We have natural barrier chemical and surgical methods of contraception and if we start with the natural ones obviously in this one you have abstinence you know like not having sex basically. The second is something that's very loosely termed the rhythm method it does have other terms but this is basically where a female will check her body temperature and like her cervical mucus like the thickness and its consistency to basically follow her fertility cycle and to determine her fertility window so the window of time when she is most likely to get pregnant and then based on that when you know your body and you know how your cycle goes then you can like not have sex basically during that period when you are most likely to get pregnant that is kind of the rhythm method i'm going to be straight up and say that this is not like the most effective and reliable method of contraception like it's mostly recommended to be used for females when they actually want to get pregnant so they can actually determine their fertility window and be like okay i'm most likely to get pregnant here so i'm gonna have sexual intercourse here you know and the third like natural method i thought i would mention here is something called the pull out method again it's not the most reliable but it's basically like penile withdrawal before ejaculation so no sperm gets into the cervix and the uterus and can't hopefully like you know fertilize an egg but again it's not reliable, you know? Sometimes that stuff cannot be controlled. So the natural methods, they are not the most effective forms of contraception. I'm gonna be straight up about it. It's very difficult to put a number on these methods to say like how effective they are because it very much depends on like the person, how willing someone is to, you know, check their symptoms, their temperature and stuff daily, how willing they are to abstain from sex during those periods, you know, does the guy know? when he's gonna ejaculate or not like sometimes like just can't be guaranteed so putting a number on this is really difficult the one study quoted like a pregnancy rate or a failure rate of 22 percent so 22 pregnancies in 100 women basically and that translates into an effectiveness of 78 percent secondly we have barrier methods of contraception so this involves condoms we also have female counterparts the femidoms and then we have the diaphragm and we also have iud's which i'm going to talk about as chemical forms of contraception because that is their main function but they can to some degree and arguably act as a barrier but like the number one form of barrier contraception is a condom and they are quoted to be like 98 percent effective so two pregnancies per 100 women or a failure rate of two percent but i will just give a heads up and say that you will see different figures quoted depending on the study and the research that's been done but we're just going to say they're 98% effective. We then do have quite a few different forms of chemical contraception. So the first as I mentioned are IUDs, intrauterine devices. Now these can be hormonal 
or non-hormonal. And I'm going to talk mostly about the non-hormonal copper IUDs because I had a Gynafix fitted and that is a non-hormonal copper IUD. And if you want to hear me talk exclusively about the Gynafix, I will link down below that video where I talk about its biology and my experience getting it fitted. But we'll talk a bit more in detail about like both types as well. So the hormonal ones and the non-hormonal ones just to see how they both work. But an IUD is basically a small device that's inserted into the uterus essentially. Other forms of chemical contraception then are the oral contraceptive pills. So you have lots of different types that we'll talk about. You also have the injection, which is for example called DMPA. And then you also have the subdermal implant. The implant is largely advantageous over the other two because it reduces the risk of like the user forgetting to take the pill or have the injection for example but then the final form of chemical contraception i thought i would just mention even though this isn't really used alone we do have something called spermicide so that is used to like kill sperm or at least like reduce their motility but as i said it's mostly used in conjunction with a barrier contraceptive so like a condom for example or the diaphragm so the failure rate or the pregnancy rate for the pill and the injection that is like somewhere between four and seven percent whereas for the implant and the iud's they have an effectiveness of over 99 percent so that means the pregnancy rate or the failure rate is less than one percent and that effectiveness so over 99 percent is also true for the surgical methods of contraception so we have two of these we have the male one so you have a vasectomy that is where you like cut the sperm ducts and it is potentially reversible and then the female equivalent is what we call tubal ligation where you tie off the fallopian tubes or the oviducts which basically take the egg to the uterus if you want like full female anatomy i've made a couple of videos on my biology channel biology which like will show you a full diagram of the uterus the cervix everything that's going on in your reproductive system so i can leave those as well down below if you're interested but that's like all of the different forms of contraception. At the moment, oral contraceptive pills are still the most commonly used contraceptive, although we have seen an increase in uptake of like the implant and IUDs recently, and like they are the most effective in terms of numbers. Obviously, alongside the surgical methods, they have an effectiveness of over 99%. And then those that are associated with the most risks, I would say, is the combined oral contraceptive pill, which we'll talk about and the reasons for that. So we're now going to talk specifically about the non hormonal IUDs because I had a Gynafix fitted that is a non-hormonal copper IUD. Now these devices are primarily functioning because they kill the sperm in the uterus and the cervix so it can't then fertilize the egg and you can't get pregnant and that's largely because of the copper in the device so the copper device releases the copper salts and that is toxic to the sperm and it also initiates a very mild inflammatory reaction in the endometrium and that is also another reason as to why it's unfavorable for like the sperm to swim it's also unfavorable for like the egg and the egg to even embed in that uterus obviously one of the main advantages of a copper iud is that it's one of the most effective forms of contraception as we said it's over 99 percent effective and it can also be used as emergency contraception so say you've had unprotected sex within the next five days you can have a copper coil fitted and it will significantly reduce your risk of getting pregnant when these devices are fitted as well you can have like sti testing alongside which is something i had done so you've got like two in one and they can last a really long time so they are long lasting forms of contraception and i also think an advantage is the fact that they are non-hormonal like you don't have artificial hormones in your body that is something i was looking for but again i will stress that the choice of contraception that you decide to get is ultimately your decision obviously though they do have their disadvantages like every form of contraception out there so firstly they require a professional to fit them there's a slight risk of pelvic infection when you have it inserted and they can also sometimes fall out the final disadvantage i need to mention is something that i find quite confusing and strange at the moment and that's largely because we don't have a sound explanation for it it's quite like enigmatic at the moment the copper iud's they don't halt your menstrual cycle but what they can do is they can sometimes make your periods like longer heavier or more painful and based on the research at the moment we think that is more so the case with the t copper coil as opposed to the gynafix 
But as I said, we still need to do more research in this area. And then in terms of why they might cause those changes, it might be to do with the release of prostaglandins, which are hormone-like substances, they're lipids, and they might be released during the tissue damage associated with the device being inserted. And that might cause a change to your flow. But it is also very personal, like sometimes it won't cause these changes. So I would obviously be aware of this, but as I said, like your experience might be very different to anyone else, you know? The so final thing I will mention as well, because I have seen it thrown around, is this idea of like copper allergies. Do these copper IUDs cause an allergic reaction? Because copper allergy is a thing, it is very, very rare. And there have been some reported cases of an allergic reaction associated with a copper IUD. I don't know whether that was with a Gynafix or like um, the T copper coil, but like it has happened. So, you know, clearly something might happen, but I would definitely say that it's very rare. And often it might not be a copper allergy. It might be an allergic reaction to a different impurity in the device, so like nickel for example, and the gynafixes, they are made with very, very pure copper. So I wouldn't say this is a very big issue at all, but like if you do have a concern with that, I would mention it to your doctor or the physician and so they are aware of it you know like we should always be aware of these risks whether or not you actually have that complication is you know based on personal experience but i just thought i would mention it in the final section of this video then i wanted to talk about hormonal contraceptives some of the different types how they function some of their pros and cons often we mostly think of the oral contraceptive pill but obviously we have different types of those and then we also have like the subdermal implant you have injections you also have like the vaginal ring for example these all use hormones so you can either have those that just use progesterone or you can have those that combine progesterone with estrogen so i'm firstly going to talk about progesterone this can be used in a hormonal contraceptive in its natural form as progesterone but we also have artificial forms of progesterone as well and they're called the progestins but regardless they function in the same way so like you have very high levels of progesterone when you're using a progesterone only hormonal contraceptive it would help if you were familiar with the menstrual cycle so again i'm gonna leave the video i have on biology that will explain all of that but the high levels of progesterone what that basically does is it suppresses the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and that normally tells the pituitary gland in the brain to release both fsh and lh fsh that causes a follicle to develop and mature in the ovary and then lh is responsible for ovulation so if you suppress their release you don't allow egg to mature in the ovaries and you don't allow them to also be released at ovulation the really high levels of progesterone they also thicken your cervical mucus so it makes it harder for the sperm to swim and then the final thing that the high levels of progesterone will do is it causes the endometrium so the lining of your uterus basically to thin and that's sometimes not what we expect because in the menstrual cycle progesterone its function is to maintain the lining of the womb we say so it maintains its thickness but we have to remember that during the menstrual cycle before progesterone acts estrogen has caused the lining of the uterus to thicken so that's the proliferative phase and then progesterone acts afterwards and it maintains the thickness but in the context of a very high level of progesterone and low levels of estrogen so we have a high progesterone to estrogen ratio we could say that is when progesterone will cause thinning of the lining of the womb it becomes atrophic as i said and that can lead to what we call breakthrough bleeding or like irregular bleeding with the progesterone only hormonal contraceptives and the reason why that's good in contraception is because it makes it unfavorable for a fertilized egg to implant so say a sperm cell does meet an egg and it fertilizes the egg what it's going to do is it's going to implant in the lining of the womb and that's why it should normally be thick but if you've thinned that lining of the womb then it's less likely for that fertilized egg to implant and again it's less likely for you to get pregnant so that's the function of progesterone as a hormone in these hormonal contraceptives and when we see progesterone on its own it can take the form of the progesterone only pill so what we call the pop abbreviated we have progesterone only iud's we have injections so that's what i said before that something called dmpa and then we also have the subdermal implant which can sometimes only use progesterone so we have like four main types similar to the copper iud's the progesterone only hormonal iud it can last a really long time but again 
you need like someone to insert it. The implant is also effective for a really long time. And then with the pill, obviously you have to remember to take it, which is one of the main disadvantages. But like the good thing about the pill is that even though it can stop your periods, they can often resume within one cycle if you stop taking it. So it's very easy to stop and start taking this form of the pill. It has fewer risks associated with it in contrast to the combined contraceptive pill that we'll talk about. It can be used as emergency contraception. The morning after pill is usually one that only contains progesterone, the artificial form of progesterone, so a progestin. And it can also reduce heavy bleeding. The injection, as I mentioned, DMPA, that can't be stopped and started so easily like the pill just because when you inject it, you can either inject it under the skin, so subcutaneously or into the muscle. Like, because it is sometimes stored in adipose tissue, that means your period won't often resume as quickly once you stop taking the injection because as I said, it's stored in adipose or fat tissue. And finally, you have the combined hormonal contraceptives. So those that combine progesterone with estrogen so firstly with estrogen again like progesterone it's suppressing the release of fsh and lh but then the logic behind adding estrogen because you know if they do the same thing why do you have to have both the combined hormonal contraceptives are often more advantageous because they can reduce the irregular bleeding that is sometimes brought about with the use of the progesterone only hormonal contraceptives like because of that endometrial atrophy you can sometimes have like breakthrough bleeding and so irregular bleeding and with the combined hormonal contraceptives they like can regulate your periods basically they don't lead to irregular bleeding and so obviously we have the combined oral contraceptive pill you have the vaginal ring and you also have the patch as well which can be used and it has both hormones in now a little bit of an evaluation between like combined hormonal contraceptives and those that only use progesterone Obviously, I've hinted at the fact that the advantages of the combined ones are, you know, regulating your periods. They can also reduce things like acne and like dark hair growth because we think they act to like reduce the levels of testosterone. So like the male hormone, we could say. And then the final thing we think that they can relieve are like some of the symptoms associated with PMDD. So this is pre-menstrual dysphoric disorder where like someone can feel like really low or depressed and unhappy or they can have like bloating. All of these different symptoms might be alleviated with combined hormonal contraceptives as opposed to those just using progesterone. But then on the flip side, I did say that progesterone only contraceptives, they have a better safety profile in comparison to the combined hormonal contraceptives. So those that combine progesterone with estrogen. And the main disadvantage with the combined ones is that there is an increased risk of venous thrombosis. So basically the formation of blood clots in your veins. And we think that's because the estrogen activates your like blood clotting system. So for example, it can increase the concentrations of something we call fibrinogen, which is involved in blood clotting and the coagulation factors also involved. So yes, there is a higher chance of the formation of blood clots. And this risk will be even higher for those that already have existing risk factors. So those with like, you know, a high body weight or like those people who smoke, they only act to elevate their risk if they're using these forms of contraception. And the last thing on this topic, I promise, is cancer basically. So obviously not always the best conversations to have, but the combined contraceptives they are thought to increase or they are associated with increased risk of like breast cancer but then we think they might be protective against endometrial and ovarian cancers so there are like mixed studies mixed results and again it's all like tentative science is always changing but i just thought i would mention that as well take a deep breath i know that was a lot of information for you guys to take in but that's basically contraception i hope you are now an expert and you know it's the stuff you should know if you want to be mindful definitely i like this video if you did enjoy it i really hope you learned something so also give this video a thumbs up if you did leave any comments questions down below i'm more than happy to answer those for you guys and subscribe if you are new hit the bell so you know when i upload and as always i will speak to you very soon in another video bye guys Credit cards filled in for you.
there's no place like Crown. There's no place like Crown.